Much of this was led by the Spirit of God. Uh, he did give me scriptures to follow through. Some of this has been my observations and some of the things, struggles that I've had in my own life with believing. You know, we always hear people say, ministers talk about, you know, when you're standing in faith for something, only believe, only believe, only believe. And you sit there and go, I'm trying to believe and nothing's happening. And then the next thing is, well, what does it mean to believe? Then you start struggling with the definition and this and that. Uh, we, we, we believe, but then we're not sure we believe. We, we're a lot like the man whose son uh, had, epi- had a, a devil uh, that gave off the symptoms of epilepsy, and he brought them to the disciples, and they couldn't cast him out. So he went to Jesus. And, uh, you know, believe him. He asked him, he said, do you believe I can do this? And he said, he said, yes, but help my unbelief. You can believe and have disbelief at the same time. You can believe in your heart and have disbelief in your head. So people struggle with that. Now, what I've, as I was putting, studying this out and writing things down, the first thing that came to me was most people won't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Most people will not let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. How many of you had a basic set of beliefs about anything and everything in life, which I, before you even got born again? I believe this is this. I believe that's right. I believe, you know, I, in, in any number of subjects, from the right way to work to the wrong way to work, the right way to vote, the wrong way to vote, you know, the, the right way to save money, you know, the right way to do the wrong way for this. We've all got... And, and most people, when they come into the things of God and they start hearing about what the Bible has to offer and what God asks us to do to, to step out in faith and believe, whether it's for healing, for blessing, for peace, or whatever it is, the biggest stumbling block most people come up against is their predetermined ideas of what's right and what's wrong. That's one of the first things that has to go when you believe in Christ. You pretty much have to throw, well, my dad did this. You know, my dad's passed away now, and, you know, I'm honoring my dad by believing this. Well, what if that's what killed your dad? Uh, You know, we have those things. Or, oh, my granddad believed that this was the only way to, to, to work. So, how'd that work for your dad? Well, he was disabled at 46 from the way he worked. Or he worked himself to death, and then when it was finally time to retire, he died. Never got to enjoy his retirement. Why? Because he was a workaholic. Well, obviously, then, you wouldn't want to mimic that, would you? We've got to put away our preconceived notions about Christ, about the Word of God, about what's right and what's wrong, how to do something, and how not to do something, if we're going to delve into the Word and line ourselves up with Scripture. Because a lot of what we're going to find in the Word of God is going to be totally opposed to what we've been raised to think and believe. And most of us, when it comes to things like healing and prosperity and such, we struggle with unbelief. One of the biggest struggles that that Christians first have after they get born again is tithing. Man, some people fight with that their whole life. Well, I just don't believe, you know, if I, if I tithe, I, I, and then you tell me, don't worry about it, God's going to pay my bills this month. I, I don't believe that. Uh, how many of you besides me went through that? And, and so we struggle with unbelief. And so how do, how do we overcome unbelief? Well, First thing is, is you've got to believe the Bible because it's truth. Yes, it is. There's your first stumbling block right there. Well, I mean, the Bible was written by men. Well, the Bible says that holy men of God wrote as they were led by the Holy Spirit. Right. So basically, men penned it 
like secretaries, but God dictated it. And we have to look at that and say, well, I mean, this Bible, there are other books that are, and other philosophies that are much older. Or much, how can we just believe all that? Well, it's a decision. Once you believe Christ is your Savior, if you really believe he's your Savior and you invite him into your heart, then every single thing he said is the absolute truth. And you, you have no right to doubt it. Not if you're a believer. Think about that. You have no right to doubt it. If you're really telling me you're a believer. Because believers believe, doubters doubt. And if you doubt if what he said is true, how can you possibly believe that what he said about him being God is true? Once you settle Christ is God, and he's the Messiah, and he, di and, and he died for your sins, and believing in him gets you out of hell and into heaven, don't be a bonehead and not believe what he tells you after that about other things. You either believe in him or you don't. It's as simple as that. Well, society says this. There's a lot of things society has said, and they change constantly. When I got out of the service and I originally went to college, I studied psychology was one of the areas I thought I wanted to go into. So I, you have to take sociology classes and psychology classes, and, and uh, I enjoyed them, except that I began to notice something very strange. Depending on who the author of the book was that we were studying, the rules changed. With every psychologist, there was a different set of rules for the same issues. And finally, when I was at Bible, when I was at Bible school at Rama, I was talking with a, with a friend of mine who had been a psychology major. He was a much older man. And he told us, he said, it is so bad now that the entire principles of psychology are completely changed at every five years. It used to be like every 50 years. And then, and then back it was 100 years before any change. And he said, it's kind of like technology. And so they're, going, they're at the point now where a book that's written this month on psychology and what the new rules are will be out of date in three to six months because they'll have a new perspective on it. Why? Because they don't know what they're talking about. Without the wisdom of God, without the word of God, you don't really know anything about the, the mind the will, the emotions, and the spirit of man. I mean, they don't, psychologists don't even really believe in a soul. They call it the subconscious. I mean, when you start out with a misconception like that, you've got no place to go but down. So we deal with that. Another thing that affects our ability to, to receive or to believe is sin, particularly sin habits. Sin habits cause us to have doubt and unbelief when we're standing in faith for something. Why? Because we are condemning ourselves. We feel guilty. Well, I did this. Yeah, did you ask forgiveness? Yes, I did. Did you, you believe you received forgiveness? Yes. Good, now you can believe and you're, you're fine. Yeah, but this isn't the first time. This isn't the fifth time. This isn't the hundredth time, or whatever that may be. You know, I'm sure that's got to be, I mean, how, how can God, you know, answer this prayer when just because I asked forgiveness and he cleansed me of what I did yesterday when I've got 16 years worth of lousy track record on this particular issue? Well, mainly because God has no knowledge of your 16 years. None. None. Once you put it under the blood, he cannot. It, the minute he decides to remember it, he ceases to be God Almighty. Because he would then become a liar. He doesn't know. You ever start a confession and say, God, you know that thing that I, I did and I asked forgiveness for yesterday? I did it again. And if you could hear his audible voice, he would have to say, well, you're going to have to tell me, son, because I don't remember what you did yesterday. Now, our intellect wants to doubt that because we thrive on guilt. 
Mankind thrives on guilt. It's easier for us to believe we're guilty and don't deserve anything than to put bold faith in it and believe we deserve it because he said we do. See, we've mis- we mistake confidence in the word for pride. God tells you to be confident in the word, in the confident in the word. That's not pride. That's smart. That's smart. If you went to if you went to a championship boxing match, and the and the corner trainer of one of the boxers came up and said, "Put on your money, all your money on my boy." The mob just paid the opponent a million dollars to take a dive. And you knew this guy well, and you knew he knew he had connections. Would you still vote on the other guy or doubt? Or would you go put money down? You'd go put money down. When you have the inside track, when you know who's going to win, when you know one professional sports team has already got the, the, the crime has already gotten in, and they're going to shave points so that the point spread is better for those who, you know, who, who bet in Vegas. My wife grew up with, a, with, with friends uh, that, that she'd had all of, all of her life, and one of them was a bookie. And uh, they would go to the fair, like the Windsor Fair and stuff, and he would tell her which horses to bet on because they had gone, this is before she got saved, because... He knew everybody in the paddock, and, and back in those days, the sulky races, I don't know, they may still be, were about as crooked as they get. They decide, because everything works on points, they decide who's going to come in first, second, and third. And if you ever watch them, you can see them, they're racing, and all of a sudden, the guy's holding them back. And I always thought, if you're trying to win, why are you holding them back? I was naive about these things. So, and every time my wife listened to him, she came, she, she turned in a $2 bet into a few dollars, and have more spending money to go buy clothes? Sometime, hun- yes. Hun- and we, we believe natural men when we know, when we, can tr- we trust their word. She trusted the word of a bookie. You want me to lead? <laughs> she trusted the word of a bookie. So, if she, and yet, well, come on. We, we would all probably do the same thing if somebody just came up and told us if we weren't soliciting it and we weren't giving him the money to bet, we wouldn't do it ourselves because you're not supposed to use a bookie to do those things. And you'd go and you'd put money down. Hey, I won $50. No, you weren't. You just had a gift. But Jesus Christ says, if you do this, I'll do that. We go, well, I don't know about that. How lame is that? How weak in our faith is that? It's because we have doubt and unbelief. We're still judging everything by the word. We, we can't doubt our forgiveness after asking for it. How many of you believe God wouldn't tell us to do something that he himself wasn't willing to do? Do you believe he's that honest and that sincere? Well, one of the disciples asked him, Lord... How many times should we forgive our enemies? Times seven? He thought he was being really generous. And the Lord said, no, I'm telling you, 70 times seven. And that was daily. That's 490 times a day to forgive one guy a sin. How 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 would God dare to tell us to do that and not him be willing to do it himself? He'll forgive you 490 times a day. And you said, yeah, but I mean, I'm talking six years. You forgot something. A day with the Lord is is a thousand years, and a thousand years is is one day. You can't outlive his day. He He will continue to forgive you if you continue to ask, in faith, believing that your desire is to change. That's called repentance part of asking. If, if he wants you and I to do it, he can't not do it. So get over your bad self and start receiving your forgiveness and your cleansing. 
I looked up the word unbelief. It, it, the word, the word in, in Greek is A-P-I-S-T-I-A. It's apistia. And this is what it means. Faithlessness. Faithlessness. Unfaithfulness. Weakness of faith. Not to be trusted. When we doubt, we are saying Jesus and the Bible is not to be trusted. Untrustworthy, and this one is even more bold. I don't trust God in this. I don't trust in the Word. So, well, that's the Word, that's not God. Well, one, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh later on, in a few verses down. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. If you want to talk to Jesus, read the Word. And He's not just the Word of the New Testament. He's the Word of the entire Bible. Jesus is the Word. And scripture says he's exalted his word above his name. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Oh, yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I have faith in Jesus. Do you have faith in the word? Nah, maybe. You just lied then. You just said you had faith in Jesus. That's right. No, yeah, I do, but I don't have faith in the word. Jesus is the word. When you're saying you don't have faith in the word, you're saying you don't have faith in Jesus. Sometimes you got to understand, believing doesn't mean you have this strong, unwavering, unquestioning strength within you that says, ah, I have this belief and it just happens. No. Your body, your mind, and your emotions and your will will totally disagree with your spirit decision to stand. And do you know what? You tell them all to shut up and you move on. You say, you will bow the knee. You will bow the knee to the word. You refuse to speak anything else. You refuse to think anything else. You refuse to meditate on anything else. Another definition of unbelief is covenant breaking. Blood covenant breaking. Now, you all know the story about the blood covenant and what that means, the, the, whole, the whole exercise of the blood covenant. Two people commit their lives one to another. Everything they have, is now the other person has access to if needed. That other person, everything they have is accessible to the other man if they should need it. Their children, be, their children become each other's children. Their families become each other's families. Their protection becomes each other's protection. Their debts become each other's debts. They seal it in blood. There's a curse for breaking a blood covenant. Terrible curses. If you go back into, uh, into the Old Testament, uh, when, when God, before they go into the promised land and God sets, splits the tribes in half and puts half the tribes on one side of a mountain, the other half on the other side of the mountain, one speaks all the blessings, like Deuteronomy 28 and such, and then the others speak back every curse if you break the covenant. There's a curse for, for breaking the covenant. Do you know what that curse is? God's not cursing us. You're stuck with life you're stuck with all the benefits of an unbeliever, which is sickness, poverty, and death. And you're doing it to yourself. Hello. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I like the blessing part. Amen. He'll bless me coming and going in the city and in the country. He'll bless whatever I set my hand unto. Though my enemies come against me one way, they'll flee from me seven ways. All my animals will be blessed. My barns will be filled. I mean, this is good stuff. Amen. I prefer that. And you make a choice to believe it. And you say, but to honestly, 
the, one of the main reasons we believe what the world says more than what the Word says is we have had more time being indoctrinated in what the world believes unless you were born and raised from the crib in a solid faith, Bible-believing, Bible-studying, covenant-living family, you heard more about, the, about the, what the world believes is the way to do things than anything else. We get it from our teachers in school. We get it from our doctors. We get it from television. We get it from friends. We get it from people who don't believe in God. And we All day long, we're inundated with it. I sit down in front. You stop and think about how inundated you and I have been in with television and with radio stations and stuff. We, oh, I like this song. It's a catchy tune. Sometime listen to all the lyrics and, and that you're singing along with and listen to the curse you're, you're, you're singing over yourself. Or listen to the, listen to the filth you're, 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 you're allowing your brain to, to meditate on. You know, the, the, the disrespect for women, the disrespect for government, the disrespect for authority, uh, the, the, the twisted sex, the murder, the, the arrogance, the drugs. I mean, it, it's full of it. And you say, oh, I thank God I was born in the 50s. I was listening to a song uh, on the radio that I liked back in, that I heard in the, in the early 60s called Under the Boardwalk. I'm trying to remember what the band's name was. The Drifters. Was it? The, thank you, dear. And, and I, I really liked that song. And I, in my mind, I knew all the words to the song until they got to the line that I thought I knew. And uh, under the boardwalk, we'll be falling in love. But that's not what it says in the record. Under the boardwalk, we'll be making love. Now, I'm not an idiot. They're not playing patty cake and kissing each other on the cheek. That was back then. You go back to the 40s. One of my favorite Christmas songs, Baby, It's Cold Outside. You listen to that. He gets the broad drunk. Excuse me. The young lady. He gets her drunk. Yes. He gets her drunk until the point where she finally says, yeah, it's kind of cold. <laughs> and and I, you know, I'm thinking, we laugh about that, but now think of the stuff that's on the radio now. Now they just go, they cut to the chase. Sex, drug, rock and roll, and go out and shoot somebody. Hate authority. And we wonder why we struggle in our minds. I can remember the heartbreak of psoriasis. I mean, you remember that commercial? The heartbreak of psoriasis. How many of you know that, I mean, I grew up realizing that when I be, became an adult, I was going to need Haley's M.O. That... You, it's an over-the-drug diarrhea medicine. I knew, I knew from these programs that when I hit a certain age, I was going to need medication for diarrhea. <laughs> or at the very least, Pepto-Bismol, because my stomach was going to be irritated. I knew that out there waiting for me somewhere was not just a headache, but an Excedrin headache number nine. Not even a one, two, or a three. And then you hear stuff like, well, after the average person after they retire lives three years. Hey, we had somebody tell us the other day the average lifespan of a retired missionary, of a retired minister is nine months. Nine months. Nine months. Well, I, 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 I so, so there, you wonder why ministers don't want to retire. I'm a great man of faith. You ready to retire? Get thee behind me, Satan. Not because they like to stay in the pulpit, but they want more than nine months. 
You can't be in the ministry without having heartache, heartbreak, being broken down physically and worn out so that when you get to the end of the road, you're glad for Jesus to take you home. No, that's what you hear. And then we hear Lester Summerall, who in his 80s going, I'm just getting started. This is great. I mean, he's put me out in the middle of the jungle with bloodthirsty cannibals. What an exciting time that was. I'm like, this guy knows something I don't know. Yes, he knows to believe the word. He wasn't worried about getting eaten. He just knew he was going to get the whole tribe saved. He believed God. Everybody said, oh, I wish I could have a, a ministry like that. Really? Are you willing to believe it? Exactly. How'd you like to be sitting in the hut in the middle of, a, of the plains of Africa? Not in the jungle, in the middle of the plains of Africa. You're sitting in the, in the chief's house. You're, you're talking to him about getting born again because you know if you can get him born again, the whole tribe will become born again. You're halfway through the conversation and the witch doctor falls through the roof of your, of, of, of your hut. There are no trees around him. There are no ladders. And, and, and so they were both a little surprised and Lester confronted him and asked him what happened and could the chief relayed. He had a vial of human blood and he was flying and as long as he had human blood and kept sprinkling it out, he flew. And he said the minute he ran out of human blood, he, pew, and he just happened to land right at the feet of Smith Wigglesworth. Now, do you know what would happen with most people? Most people would leave totally afraid that witch doctor's spells were more powerful than the Christ that told them to get there. We better leave. I heard a minister of the gospel say, he was talking about, oh, this guy has raised 12, 13 people from the dead. He's got a dynamic ministry. He's afraid of nothing. He said, and my friend and, and his brother went down to this village down in South America with them. And they, he said, as they're going into this into this, uh, into this hut or home, small shack home, where this demon-possessed woman was, he told him, he said, listen, he said, we're, this, this, we're going to go in there and we're going to take, he said, do not have any doubt or fear. He said, if you have any doubt or fear, stay out. He said, we're going to go in there. He said, we're going to cast that devil out. And he said, as soon as I do, you, he said, you just follow me and we're running straight out of the village because if, if, if she catches you, she'll kill you. So what kind of authority was that? What kind of authority? Do you think that that person really believed? I concluded one thing. Either the guy liked to tell tall stories or he totally misrepresented that minister because if you've got faith to cast the devil out, that means the devil's afraid of you and he's not going to run. He's not going to attack you. No faith, doubt and unbelief. So we've got to remember what we put in us the most is what we're going to believe. Anybody here struggle? Just everybody close your eyes because I don't want anybody embarrassed. Anybody here struggle with a continual illness? That, whether you've had it and, and over one long period of time or it just keeps coming back. Let me see your hands. Put your hands up real high quick. Every, all right. Okay, put them down. How many, of you some, how many of you struggle with a type of illness all the time, like every season you get the cold or you get the flu? Or it seems that way. Let me see your hands. Okay, a few more. Do you, know, do you know why? Because you are now trained to receive it. You can open your eyes. You're now trained to receive it. Because what you put in you is, is what you're going to believe the most. Flu season is coming upon us. And we at Walmart Pharmacy, for $10, will give you your flu shot. And I'll guarantee you, you'll get the flu. More people get it than don't. I don't want you to put flu germs in me. I'm standing daily on the word for the blood of Christ to be in me. Now, I'm not saying you can't use doctors. But doctors don't know more than the Bible. As a matter of fact, I've had some doctors say, don't trust doctors. 
Celeste just the other day had a, had a, had a doctor tell her, Celeste was talking about something. She says, Celeste, whatever you do, don't trust what doctors tell you. She's a doctor. Because most of them, they know just enough to make themselves dangerous. And they use what they understand to try and help. But there's not a doctor in the world who believes they can cure anything. A regular doctor. But Dr. Jesus doesn't just cure things. He defeats them, crushes them, kills them, removes them from your life, never to be seen again, if you'll trust in his word. But if you're sitting down, do you, when, we, when we're watching television, if a commercial for medication comes on, we, kick, we either change channels or shut the volume down and talk. There was, there's one thing I noticed the other day. There's this one drug, I, I, I don't remember what it's called right now. I wouldn't tell you if I remembered. Uh, but the first time it came on, or I'd heard about it, because you, you go, we can't always shut it and change it fast enough, it was a cure for this particular problem. And then six months later, it was a different commercial, and it was a cure for something different. And then six, now, over the last five years, this one drug has been named. As it, and every single time it morphs to being the answer, for the most part, for something different. And you don't hear anything about the stuff before. And then you get this guy. Anybody ever seen that commercial of the guy who talks? He's the fastest talker in the world. And oh, it's, I mean, he just, he's like, and the other guy goes, and, and, and he's read like six lines. And so they find a guy like that to tell you all the side effects yeah. of the drug. Yeah. Or all of the downside of your new car, car loan contract. <laughs> and and the, the side effects are generally worse than the disease. Sure. Yeah, this is going to help you. Now, just so you understand, this, you're going to feel much better. But in about five years, your kidneys are going to croak. Who would much rather trust healing virtue of the Word of God? Amen. I mean, come on. How did that happen to us? By Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. What you stick in your ears is what you're going to believe. But that verse goes on and says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So Bible faith comes by hearing the Word of God whether you listen to it from the pulpit, whether you listen to it on the radio or on television, whether you listen to it uh, on, on your laptop, your tablet, or your computer, whether you listen to it as you're reading an article about it, or whether you listen to it as you're quoting scriptures, faith comes, faith comes, faith comes. And you need to be as diligent about what you put in your vessel on the promises of God as you are not to, minute, not to miss one episode of Walking Dead. I, I know more spirit-filled Christians that walk Walking Dead than unbelievers. Or whatever your favorite show is. You know, fun Time with Spocky, whatever it is. Listen to this, Matthew 12, 34. If you're wondering why you're not getting your healing, why you're not getting your finances, why you're not overcoming like you want to. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what you really believe, have somebody keep track of everything you say over the course of a day. You'd be amazed at how many things you say you strongly believe God for that you speak doubt and unbelief over throughout the day. Amen. Watching a program or some friend sends you one of those emails where 
You see this nice, happy little rabbit playing, and all of a sudden this ugly face sticks out at you, and he goes, ah! And you turn around and say, oh my God, that, that about scared me to death. Don't say that. Don't say that. Faith comes by hearing. You say, well, that's just a frivolous statement. Did you hear it? Do you believe the Bible? Faith comes by hearing. Amen. That gave me a start. Th- unto life. Yeah. Right. Not Nothing scares you to death. You walk out of the... I mean, how many people will walk out of the out of uh, their house where they're visiting their friends there and they've been joking and kidding. They're going, hey, all right, guys, we'll see you next week unless the train hits me. (laughs) People say that stuff. People say that stuff. Said, how are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling good, but you know, my uncle had diabetes. You know, he didn't have it until he was 40. And, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 38. I get two more years and I'll probably get diabetes too. Well, it was just your uncle. Yeah, well, my uncle's uncle had diabetes. <laughs> and his uncle, you have your own strain of uncle diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> but you confess it, you're going to get it. Well, I was born with it. Oh, okay. You're also born with a, with a, with a dead soul, and you asked Jesus to be your Savior, and you, got, you, got, you, you died, the old you died, and the new you was born into... So you don't have to keep that if you don't want it. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, well, gee, you don't understand, man. I've lived this my whole life. I've got, I've got this issue and that issue and that... Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. What do the doctors tell you? Well, sooner or later, it's going to kill you. You don't need a doctor to tell you sooner or later you're going to die. How many of you know this is true? Unless Jesus returned, we are all going to die someday. But you can die healthy. Do you know how a Christian is supposed to die? Their spirit leaves their body. They don't need to go. Guys, somebody somebody actually asked Kenneth Copeland. Somebody actually asked Kenneth Copeland one day. Uh, He was actually at Rhema teaching, and somebody somebody had asked him. He said, well, Brother Hagin, if we don't get sick, how are we going to die? He says, Jesus just says, come home. He said, your spirit leaves your body. Your body ain't going to stand up very long. As a matter of fact, if you study out the word of God, you, it happens so quick, you won't even know you're dead, in the, your body's dead, until after you're dead. Did you know that? Yes. It's that fast. Twinkling of an eye, that's right. Oh, death, where is thy sting? I firmly believe that Stephen did not feel a single rock. I believe God took him. So, if it's out of the abundance of your heart that your mouth speaks, listen closely because you will be saying what you really believe about sickness, disease, pregnancy, side effects, Morning sickness or not. So how are you doing? Well, I'm getting ready for morning sickness. Bought six. Really? Yep. Why would you get ready for that? Well, it's mumps season for the kids. Got to get ready to nurse those kids through the mumps, through the measles. You know, it's cold season again. I bought five bottles of children's Robitussin DM. It's going to be late nights and nurse them through it. They always put me through hell. They don't need to get sick to put you through hell. I get in trouble. I'm glad this smaller crew tonight, this morning. So, so why is the world's confession out of us so successful? Because more people hear and speak doubt, unbelief, and death around us. The Bible says, how can two walk together as one unless they be agreed? 
You say, well, what do I do with my unsaved friends? Get them saved. But don't spend a lot of time hanging around them unless you want to maintain your unsaved theology. Now, if they're willing to sit down and listen to you share the word and grow thereby, absolutely. But if all they want to do is speak doubt and unbelief and you need life and you need it more abundantly, John 10.10, you better get around people who speak life. People of like precious faith. You see, we, most of us were raised in that world's garbage and we need cleansing. Just like reprogramming a computer. We've got to get rid of the garbage. Amen. Just totally get it out of us. The Bible tells us Ephesians 4.22. What time is it? Okay. 4.22. Put off the old man's conversation. Put off the old man's conversation. That's manner of living and manner of speaking. So here, this is how, this is how, if, now listen closely, you get down here, how we clean our brains out. This is what God's given us, Ephesians 4, 22 through 25. Put off the old man's conversation, manner of life and speaking. 23, be renewed in your mind. That word renewed means renovated and reformed. Get your mind renovated and reformed. And verse 24a says, now put on the new man. And that, that word put on means sink into it like a new garment, perfectly fitting. Another definition of, of putting it on means invest in, wrap yourself up in what? The rest of that verse says your new nature and its new principles. You've got to stay in the Word. You've got to study the Word. You've got to continually, continually, continually go over it, meditate on it, mutter it. Don't allow it to go anywhere else until you think differently and begin to think differently. Make yourself say things. Make yourself say stuff you don't believe yet. As though you believed it and that it's already true. There will come a point when you're not making yourself do it anymore. It'll be, you'll have heard it so much. So much of the word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing you. The faith will cement itself in you and you will be saying it because it's now true to you. All right? 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us this. That, uh, go ahead and turn there. 2, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You're not going to have to worry about people at the restaurant taking your seats. They're all... They all stayed home from church because it's the, the, the driving was too bad, so th they won't be there. 517. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a, no, a new person. The old life has gone, and a new life has begun. Basically, you have him now. Now learn about him and how to use him and operate in him. Who's got the King James version of that? Behind you. Go ahead, real loud. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. You have him in you. So now learn how to cooperate with him who's in you. I was telling Seth, I think last night, or the other, so the other day, when I, a lot of times I find myself when I'm praying, I've got one hand like this, but my other hand's right here. And, and I, I, was, I did that a lot, and, I, and, I, and one day I noticed it. I wasn't doing it intentionally. And I thought, I wonder why I'm doing that. And immediately the Spirit of God says, doesn't it say, behold, I stand at the door and knock? If anyone answers, my father and I will come in and stuff. He said, he's in you. He's here. Don't, don't reach out to the throne up here. Put your hand here. And so I do. I put my hand up out of honor, submitting to the great throne of authority, but right here for the intimacy of, of, of him living in me. If he's in you, you need to know more about who's in you and how to walk and live with him, you using him or operating in him. That's your new nature and it's new principles that are in the word. The second half of verse 24 of Ephesians says that he, he's righteous and holy. 
the God that's in you. You must learn to walk in this new nature of righteousness and holy, this new you. God made you righteous. Think about this. And he made you holy. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. He made you holy. You say, well, I'm not living like I'm holy. Well, that's because you're not allowing the vine dresser, the husbandman, to prune you. Remember, he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You say, man, I, I'm never going to see God then because I am not pure. No, no. You can't make yourself pure. You've got to be open to it and willing to walk it out. But over in, over in, 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 the, in, in another part of the, of the epistles, it, it, Jesus, uh, the apostle calls God the father, the husbandman. He's the dresser. That word pure, actually, this is pretty cool. That word pure actually means to be pruned. You've got to let God prune you. He makes you pr pure. He makes you pure. And when you're pure, the righteousness of God that's in you and God's holiness are able to operate and bring things to manifestation that your faith has much more easily. It removes doubt. The 25th verse says, put away, and here's how he, he says to do. This is what you're going to do. Put away lying and instead speak the truth. And I used to think that that meant, well, don't tell little white lies. Don't tell fibs. Don't tell this. And the Spirit of God said, no, that's not what that's saying. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, anything that is not of the word is a lie. And every time you speak something in opposition to the word, even though you believe it, you are lying. So stop lying by confessing things other than what the Word says and confess truth instead so that your new nature can have a, a well-paved highway to walk on. Amen. Speak the truth of the Word with your Christian brothers and not with the unsaved world, it says. That's the last part of that verse. Do you tell your brothers the truth? You... you Throw the truth at one another. How are you today? Well, by his stripes I am healed. Yes, amen. Amen. He, because he was wounded for your transgression and bruised for your iniquity. And your friend will go back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely that's true. The chastisement of your peace was on him. And by his stripes you were healed. And your brother says back yes and amen. Because he's the Lord that healeth me. That's what you're supposed to be doing. That's the kind of conversations you're supposed to be having with people of like precious faith. And if you run into a Christian who doesn't believe that, say, God bless you. I've got to go find somebody who speaks truth. If you want to listen to truth, I'll be happy to. But if you want to argue whether it's true or not, I've got to go find somebody who speaks truth. Because I need truth. I'm not going to sit around and listen to doubt and unbelief all day over a cup of coffee and a Danish. Or a health food biscuit. I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish with this part right here. Romans, oh, that thing about not with the unsaved world, that was Matthew 7, 6. Romans 14, 23. Anything that is not of faith is sin. Period. You know, if you and I confessed that sin, it would be, we'd be confessing that more than any sin of the flesh. Better to shut up than to sin against faith. If you don't have the faith to believe that, that you're healed, shut up. If somebody says, how are you? If you can't say, by his stripes I'm healed, just, how about them Red Sox? So that's what I wanted to share with you today. We need to get ourselves back on track with faith. Back on track with, with belief. And start weasel, winnowing out the unbelief that we've had since childhood. We don't need the heartbreak of psoriasis. We don't need diarrhea medicine. 
And as far as a numerical headache, you give it to somebody, go give it to your math teacher. 